Well, good morning, everybody from the UK, and welcome to uh, you wherever you're joining us from today. Um, it's nearly Christmas. Uh, we're trying to make ourselves feel a little bit festive <laughs> and cheer ourselves up a little. Um, so, uh, hence the hence the headgear, and uh, you might spot some Christmas jumpers as well. Um, so we're delighted to open up the webinar uh, this time to some of our previous panelists. Um, Hannah, we saw you just last month in November. Um, Kentaro San, we, we talked to you in July, so welcome back. And we also have KK um, Ong from Cebu Pacific here. Um, and you joined us back in April, uh, KK. So um, yeah, it feels like uh, not so long ago, but I guess um, many, many months uh, since then. So thanks everybody for agreeing to come back. Um, it can't have been too bad an experience last time, and we're looking forward to hearing from you as, uh, as we go through this morning. We should also um, say thanks to all of you listening. Uh, we've had lots of questions submitted in advance, and we're going to do our best to spend quite a bit of time today just talking um, to our panel about those questions. I can't promise any, uh, you know, that we'll be able to answer all of them. We don't have a crystal ball, unfortunately, but we'll do our best to, to have a discussion around um, some of the some of the topics and uh, see where we get to. So um, if you have any questions that, that occur to you throughout this morning, please don't hesitate to fill in the question box and um, send those over to us and we'll incorporate them as well. And we're going to have a little bit of a different format today. So normally we have a reasonably long slide deck. We don't have so many slides today because we just really want to to talk, um, and of course you can all uh, you can all see us, which is new as well. Um, not just for the purposes of sharing uh, our, uh, our Christmas headgear, but also really uh, because we want to. John, John's uh, John's nicely, uh, yep, d demonstrating that there. Um, so you know we really want to to see uh, the conversation as it uh, as it unfolds. So it feels sort of, maybe, that um, there might be some cautious optimism uh, creeping in with certainly the rollout of the Pfizer vaccine um, starting yesterday in the UK um, and a tentative relaxation of some lockdown measures in some parts of the world. Um, but, but as we'll see as we go through, there are still lots of hurdles to overcome and much, uh, many parts of the world are still in some form of lockdown, second waves, third waves, perhaps, and we'll hear more about that from, from our audience and panel. Some countries are still closed for international travel and, and indeed seem to continue to be that way for some time. Um, and there's lots of conversation and discussion in the industry about things like the common pass, digital health passports, and indeed lots of our questions have been around, um, around that topic. So. Looking forward to having some conversation about that. And I suppose, you know, the reality of all of this is will all of these tentative, optimistic moves make people feel confident enough yet to travel? Will business travel return yet be because, um, be because of all of this optimism? Or will we still see um, demand lagging through uh, through 2021? We were having an interesting conversation about that just before we started. So let's um, let's move on to our um, our agenda slide um, and uh, what we're going to cover today. So as we said, we're going to have a wider discussion about really what's happening out there in the industry. We're going to take you through our usual frequency and capacity updates and a brief look at what we think might or might not happen in quarter one 2021. So first slide and this is really um, a slide that it's a bit of a sobering perspective um, I guess uh, this sort of takes us back to the reality of um, you know of the situation that we find ourselves in. So we're looking back uh, to 20, uh, 2000, uh, which seems a very long time ago now. Um, and you can see really clearly that the impact of previous what were major events for the industry, um, we saw recovery within 12 to 18 months um, after uh, after those events. 
and the, the, the trend of growth continued. Um, you know, air travel has been resilient um, and demand has continued on this upward trajectory. Um, some, some would argue perhaps too, too strongly um, over, the last, uh, over the last 10 years. So um, we're not making any apologies for, for that sort of sobering picture, but really um, I think you, you summarized it nicely uh, the other day, John, when you said we've lost um, 15 years worth of, uh, worth of growth in, in nine months, haven't we? Did I say that? That sounds extremely <laughs> profound. Can I just say, I would not, I'd never want to be a reindeer because it is so hot wearing these things. <laughs> anyway, yes, I mean, you're right, Deirdre, it's, um, it's a sobering slide, but it just shows you both what has traditionally been the resilience of the industry and also the, the scale of the challenge we face in the next couple of years as we, as we rebuild out. Uh, there's a long, long way to go, but uh, you know, end of the year, let's be optimistic. There's got to be some good news around the corner. 2021 can't be as bad as 2020. That's yeah, that's probably about as positive as as uh, as we can be, isn't it? Okay, and I think uh, this is an interesting um, it's it's an interesting take, isn't it? So four um, key pieces of information here over the same, same time period index back again to 2000. And this is the growth rate for um, seat capacity, for flights, and then for the average aircraft size and um, airport pairs in the, in the blue line. Um, any, any thoughts from that, John? Well, I mean, you know, to, to the point, I think had we reached had we reached a situation where the market was in some ways in need of a reset and it had to happen. I mean, uh, KK, um, your your own personal work has probably accounted for a huge amount of capacity growth in uh, mm -hmm. Southeast Asia um, with Air Asia and, and now with Cebu and, and HANA. I mean, Malaysia itself has transformed itself into probably the number one low cost market in the region. And it's been great for travel um, and there's been crazy fares, but you know, maybe we just reached that point where where enough was too too much. I mean, KK, could you were you struggling to find new markets at the end of last year, beginning of this year? Or did you still have a list of places you needed to go to? No, no, no. I think um the market is still growing. Yeah, at the end of last year. I'm I'm struggling to find less congested airports. <laughs> right. Back then, yeah. And Hannah, I mean, you, you've had lots of stories recently about um, the whole Air Asia situation, financing, aircraft leases. I mean, are they? Is that a bit of a bubble that needs a reset? I mean. It's hard to say, really. I think there are still so many destinations actually within Southeast Asia that are not connected to one another that you might expect to be. Um, so there is that potential. And I think certainly, you know, airlines like Air Asia played a huge role in doing that. But yeah, there's a huge competition. Even if you just look at Malaysia itself, you've got Air Asia, you have Melindo, um, you've got Firefly. It, it's too many airlines all flying the same routes and flying very, very cheap as well. Um, so ultimately, something probably does have to give at some point, um, and perhaps this just kind of precipitated that. And there's already a comment from Timothy, who's who's probably still awake in Seattle. He's got a couple of dogs he needs to take out for their nighttime walk before he can retire. Um, but he um, he makes a point about aircraft utilization, and you know, at the moment, aircraft utilization is about six hours a day, but it was up at sort of thirteen and fourteen hours a day. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe just symptomatic of where we are, Deirdre. I think I think the, the the sort of reset idea is is interesting, isn't it? Because I think you know this we'll we'll show this later. This is a week where um, a body has come out and made a prediction about there being a hundred million outbound um, Chinese trips uh, in twenty twenty one, which. You know, if you think about the scale um, of, of growth and much of what is driving um, some of the growth to the Southeast Asian countries that we're talking about, Hannah, a lot of it is outbound um, China leisure travel, isn't it? So, you know, it, it, and if you were sort of looking at this from a detached perspective and saying, well, you know, 
which market in the world? That was one of the questions that, that we've had, you know, who, who's, who's getting this right in terms of where they are in the recovery curve? China's domestic market has, has recovered and beyond. Um, and actually, if, if we can crack safe travel um, in terms of uh, the, the destinations, then there's a market there that, that has the appetite to travel potentially um, and, can, and can come back. So it's really interesting, isn't it, when, when you were trying to envisage what does that future look like? Is it, is it a continuation on? Um, you know, depending on however long it takes to, to, to recover from this crisis, um, or are things fundamentally changed? Um, and we just, we, we don't really know the answer to that yet, do we? Um, we don't, early. but you know, there's, there's a whole load of discussion around sustainable tourism and, you know, being much more environmentally conscious in our travel. Um, mm. And I've spoken to lots of people on OAG podcast and many of them have just said, you know, this is a chance for us to redefine the product we offer, to move away from mass market, to you know, create really experiential type um, travel rather than just that sort of you know sun sand sangria type uh, experience that still exists in many many places um, and hopefully and hopefully you know it does change because that's got to be better for everyone. It's really difficult though, isn't it? Because you can see that there that, that it would be attractive for destinations, for example, that have suffered from over tourism. There's a real opportunity to reset and change and reshape what you're you're offering and what your tourism product, for example, looks like going forward. But that feels like a luxury of decision that many countries and many tourism bodies and many hoteliers will not have the luxury of being able to make that choice because of the revenue situation, because nobody planned for this to happen. Oh, and, you know, in the case of GDP, countries like Thailand, which through the year we've shown slides showing how, how reliant they are on um, tourism. And, you know, for Kentaro, San, uh, this 2021 is the year of the Olympics, isn't it, Kentaro? So yeah, yeah, it's supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, it's supposed to be. So you're, you're already planning at your airport for an Olympics guest, aren't you? Yeah, uh, as I said, it's supposed to be a very, very uh, good year for not only for our airport, but also for entire Japan. But all of a sudden, the situation has completely changed. But uh, I'm not sure, and nobody knows uh, whether the Olympic Games will be uh, hosted as usual. Uh, it, me it means that how many uh, international audience would be accepted to to mm -hmm. Japan for the next year. But uh, on top of that, I would like to emphasize on the Japanese government attitude towards the uh, international arrivals. They have been setting the very ambitious goal to uh, achieve 16 million uh, international arrivals in a couple of years. They, after even after the COVID-19 crisis, they didn't change their mind at all. So it means that uh, if the aviation world uh, wants to achieve these very fantastic curves, uh, it depends on which country has which kind of mindset to open and to welcome the international arrivals. Japanese yeah. government is still ambitious to, uh, of course, the over tourism would be the very uh, important issue in the end, for, even for Japan. But we are still uh, want to expand more and more. It it will continue to grow. I think. And, and of course, the Chinese yeah. market, it, it you know was was booming to Japan before all yeah. of this. And I think there there is a um, you know there's there's a huge appetite, isn't there, for um, leisure travel to to Japan from again. Mm. China outbound. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating destination, and I think if you think about that experiential um, sort of travel that John talked about, it ticks all of those boxes, doesn't it? Um, exactly. yeah. Okay, let's move on to our next slide, um, which is a look back to uh, our um, our usual uh, charts and table that we show you. Um, 
and it, you know, uh, we, we've sort of uh, been back and forward, haven't we, John, with uh, looking looking for glimmers of hope and glimmers of light in this, but um, we're ticking along, aren't we? We, you know, we, we we're yeah, sort of it's, it's unlikely to get beyond this anytime soon. No, I, I I think we are where we are, and it's amazing how within 55 million you can have so many changes week on week. So you know, we've seen we've seen in the last four weeks European lockdown. Uh, and the dramatic impact that's had um, and you know conversely um, as we were locking down the United States and North America was going gung-ho for Thanksgiving lots of airlines put in lots more literally hundreds of thousands of seats in um, week on week and we're still in 55 million now because Europe has come out of that four-week lockdown and the North American carriers have not surprisingly cut capacity back by um, hundreds of thousands of seats. Um, South yes, there, was a, there was a Thanksgiving. Uh, there was a Thanksgiving boost, wasn't there? That that's. Uh, that's and you can you, know, you can sort of see that when it went from 49 to 45, 45, and now back at 48. But mm -hmm. but the, the reality is we are where we are, um, and airlines are on a weekly basis cutting about six percent of global capacity. We're seeing anywhere between two and maybe even six million seats likely to come out uh, in some weeks before the year end. So it's a pretty um, it's a pretty mixed bag. But I think probably back in September we were saying we don't see it getting any better than this. And um, KK, I mean your capacity is has been pretty sort of consistent. And but you know you just respond to the market and you just see if anything happens. You just put it out there and see, don't you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, consistent um, is the right word as in consistently low <laughs> in the sense that it's highly restricted. Um, we are not allowed to operate. Uh, the borders are closed. Um, over here in the Philippines, it's almost like Australia at some point ago where even interstate travel is restricted by the local authorities. So, um, yeah, I think as of last month, we were doing about junior teens um, compared to pre-COVID level in terms of capacity. So it's it's a long marathon back. Yeah. It's interesting. I was reading an article yesterday um, by a travel marketer who was talking about this this issue that while um, two things, w one that um, you know while you're living under sort of statewide uh, travel restrictions or you know even more local restrictions about where I live, for example, we're not allowed to travel to the next um, the next council area. Um, it's really difficult to then envisage um, being able to travel to an airport and, and go somewhere. Um, but there's also this effect of, you know, the social aspect of travel. So, um, you know, we meet up with our friends, we go out for dinner, we, we do whatever, and we talk about our holiday plans. And we, you know, we talk about where we, where we want to go next. And there's an element of influence in all of that. So, you know, we're influenced by our network telling us we're going to wherever next summer. Mm -hmm. And we don't, we're not, because we don't have that sort of social interaction, This the, the essence of this article was, you know, it's, it's harder, it's even harder to then envisage that we will be able to, um, to make the, that kind of travel. I think all of that pushes the decision to travel to, to, much much closer to the point of departure doesn't it and that's really challenging not just for someone like you KK in terms of assessing what demand to 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 cater to but also for airports in terms of planning you know planning for planning for what's coming for the summer season for example yeah and you know I mean for Hannah working with the travel trade I mean they must they have the same problem, don't they? Because you just don't know what is actually going to be out there and what does get get placed in the market, and whether it sticks and whether it even operates. It's it's a very frustrating situation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've just had that Hong Kong Singapore travel bubble. Um, so that was announced on the 11th of November. Flights got booked out. Um, it was meant to start on the 23rd of November, the day before they cancelled it. Um, so again, that threw up all of the plans of, you know, travel agents who might have finally got some bookings um, and had to cancel everything all over again. Um, so that kind of thing doesn't really engender confidence, even in the travel trade to book, because you've just no idea what what's going to happen. Is this going to go ahead or not? Am I going to have to refund my customer back or not? 
maybe it's just better till I know everything can definitely operate and I avoid myself, you know, that headache of, of all of this paperwork that's involved. I think there's also the, the demystifying where can I travel to um, and what will I what will be expected of me when I get there? Um, you know, will I be able to step out of my hotel? Will I be quarantined or, you know, will, will I will I be able to to do all of the things that, you know, particularly for leisure travel, um, people go on holiday for different reasons, of course. But, you know, will I be able to partake in all of the activities that, that I would ordinarily uh, want to do? And, mm -hmm. and unpicking all of that and working out all, all of that is sort of not for the faint hearted at the moment, I think. Um, you know, it isn't just a simple case of um, book, book your book your flights and book your hotel and, and off you go. You've got to factor in um, what will it be like when I'm there? What is the testing regime? It, mm -hmm. You know, we, we saw, for example, um, in the UK a, a couple of weeks ago, announcements from some of the bigger airports about on-site airport testing facilities, which is fantastic. So, you know, you can get rapid tests done. Um, the day before travel, um, which would allow you to then comply with the requirements for certain destinations. But the cost of all of this is is not to be underestimated. Um, uh, you know, if you're, if you're adding that on yeah. to um, a, a travel budget for a family of four, then it, mm. it adds up, doesn't it? If you're paying 80, 100 pounds a, a test and then facing tests when you're in a destination and then testing on return. Um, it, mm. you know, it, it so, listen, so yeah, yeah, recently I have a very interesting chat with their travel company based in Japan. Uh, they said that uh, every people who uh, who are so familiar with the international travel is completely disappeared because the, everything has changed completely. For example, uh, nobody experienced the, the pre-test before departure and after mm -hmm. arrival and so on and so forth. And uh, when I had the chance to, to talk with them, nobody knows about the which kind of measures are uh, imposed on the connecting point like Chang Singapore Chang Airport or Hong Kong International Airport. So it's getting more and more difficult to uh, become very uh, confident to travel or even for the people who have flown every every month and every month yeah 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 your experienced traveler is is, yeah. is wrestling with with how to how to navigate yeah. all of that um, yeah yeah as well. from from the airport authority point of view we have to uh overcome this kind of uh the lack of information so we we will uh try to find a better way to convey the better information to the customers to to get back their confidence as as well as as soon as possible yeah i think what i think what's also interesting is mm. um there's been a sense and i think we've talked about this in, in previous webinars that you know the people who will have the appetite to travel will be um the people who potentially are less affected by by covid so you know the, the well, not even the millennials it's the generation uh, younger than that isn't it um who, who are who are Percep whose perception perhaps is less but you know if you if we flip that on its head and look at look into 2021 and look at who who are most likely to have been vaccinated um so you know the over 70s um maybe the over 60s if if mm. um vaccination program really gets going who yeah. has disposable income who has a sense of this might be my, my you know not my last chance to see the world but you know who has who has that desire to travel on those destinations that that um, have been on their bucket list for a long time? So we yeah, might. Teacher, actually... I, I, th I think it's fascinating because as soon as the vaccine sort of became approved and the regulatory authorities were making mm -hmm. all the positive noises, I think there's been a complete flip to mm -hmm. unlocking the silver surfers and you know all of those people because they are going to get the vaccine before anyone else apparently you know and and hopefully by the time it gets down to those of us that are in the 40 years of age bracket um, we'll be able to use it as well um, and I think I think actually there could be a renaissance of those silver surf surfers and if you then add on top of that 
this whole factor about you know frust revenge spending because we've been locked down for the last nine months there could be a boom in premium economy and business class long-haul travel in the second half of 2021 with markets such as europe australia uh, southeast asia to the united states suddenly seeing you know levels of demand that we wouldn't even have ex been the most optimistic person would have expected at this moment in time and I, I, I've said before, I think if anyone is if anyone is planning to do a trip next Thanksgiving or next Christmas or you know next Labor Day or Diwali, second half of 2021 public holidays, the holiday periods, buy a ticket as soon as you possibly can because I think demand could be oversubscribed very, mm. very quickly and airfares mm. will move rapidly for those mm -hmm. holiday periods and if you've got a if you've got a ticket and it's got flexibility you're in a much much better space than getting one percent interest in a bank account i think mm -hmm. well you heard that here first then john prediction uh... I, don't, I don't know i mean okay what do you think i mean do you think i mean you're an airline person you're selling these seats what do you think hannah what's your view okay okay you go first <laughs> sure <Hannah. laughs> I think I think the appetite for travel is still there. Um, Boracay was open up um, to non-essential travel in October. Um, we struggled in the first week. I think all the local airlines carried um, really, you know, the number of passengers on board can probably count with two hands. But subsequently, it ramped up quite fast. Um, I think as what um, Ken San said earlier, um, I think airlines, uh, travelers, we all just need clarity. At the moment, there's no uniform rules on um, travel requirement, testing requirement, quarantine requirement. Um, this is basically a bigger um, problem that stops people from booking a travel. If you are certain you know what you will be in for um, when you arrive at your destination and, and how you'll be taken care of, I think people are willing to travel. Yeah. So I think by next year, well, I, I personally don't think I mean, like, you know, in, in, in a country we, that have more than 100 or 200 million population, we probably won't have the entire population vaccinated by second half of next year. But then um, I think it's a combination of, of testing requirement and a vaccination will probably help to propel the growth next year. I, I, I tend to agree with you, John. Yeah, Hannah, Hannah with you. Sorry, Hannah, yeah, from and, your side. Yeah, I mean, in Southeast Asia, they haven't, it, it varies from country to country who will be getting the vaccine first. Um, and they still haven't come out with, yes, it's gonna be older travelers rather than younger. Of course, there's that argument for vaccinating the people who contribute to the economy the most first mm -hmm. instead. Um, but again, those will tend to be slightly older travelers, I imagine, and slightly wealthier. So yeah, it, it's, it's interesting that you say the vaccine thing has kind of turned everything on its head. It's not really the younger travellers anymore. Um, I was even talking to a Singapore travel agent yesterday about this, who they thought would be the first uh, travellers out. And they said that they thought in particular Singaporean, uh, you know, younger travellers were actually a bit more, that they were a bit more health concerned, um, maybe than than the next generation. So yeah, yeah. That matter, potentially, you know, potentially this is that's also a generation that that will bear the biggest brunt of um, uh, employment, um, you know, the, the employment situation in terms of job cuts or furloughs or, um, you know, economic impact, I, I sense is is far worse for people of working age than, than it is, um, of, of course. And, um, yeah, and, and, you know, a fantastic Christmas present for your mother in law. You know, if you could get her vaccinated and you could get her a ticket or a one way ticket to Australia, um, then everyone would be set and happy for 20. Right, that's, that's, that's the signal. John's mentioned his mother in law. We need to move on. <laughs> we need to move on. Um, OK, let's uh, we've just got a couple more slides to show you and then we're going to jump into um, to, to, to all of your questions. Now, um, you will recognize uh, those of you who've been here before. Um, this um, uh, this slide here, and this really uh, conveys um, that over each month we have seen progressively the schedule adjusted um, each month, um, and and I think all that we really can confidently take from this chart is that the short term uh, the planning horizon is still short term, very short term for airlines. Um, weekly capacity has now sort of settled around this 55 million mark and it's been there since early November. 
um, carriers are still projecting that there's going to be a final Christmas push up to 66 million by the end of December, but that frankly just seems unlikely um, in just the last month. So since we spoke to you last on, on this webinar, um, there have been 62 million seats taken out for November and December. So um, this optimistic picture, I think, um, w will not materialise. Typically, I, I, we've got the US, of course, who make up quite a large proportion of that. And, you know, we're now hearing sentiment about lockdowns in California, lockdowns in New York, uh, you know, sensible advice about not traveling for the seasonal holidays, even um, what had been a growth market to Mexico. Uh, we're hearing, you know, Mexican tourist destinations saying, think twice. Um, so it, it's just not reality, Deirdre, is it? I mean, we're going to be yeah. down to 55 um, million simple and, and i guess you know that then looking forward into quarter one <clears throat> so that assumes that 66 million sort of starting point at the beginning of january and we're showing here now um 2019 2020 and 2021 um and and actually uh we've had lots of discussion behind the scenes uh not necessarily for today but about what, what do we measure ourselves against going forward? You know, we, we can't, we, we're not going to be able to look back to 2019 forever. Is 2020 a good comparison or do we just take a zero base and start start from scratch and, you know, um, stop comparing to anything? <clears throat> but, you know, this, uh, on the basis of what we're showing here, um, this projected journey back to you know, 90 odd, uh, 90 odd million by the end of March just isn't, it's not going to happen, is it, is it, John? No, and, you know, fortunately the scale is very good because we typically were at about 106 million seats a week. So, uh, to, look, does anyone out there, you know, and please, if you think so, tell us in a question, does anyone really think we're going to be back to 90% of capacity by the end of March? and allowing for load factors being about 10 or 15 points behind that. Do we really think we're gonna be back to 70%-ish points of global demand by the end of March? Um, most of the world will not even have started vaccination programs by then. Uh, and those that have, you know, it will be the very selective few who will have had both double dip doses and be in a position to travel. And we don't have tr uh, any sort of global, um, certification process in the, in the pipeline at the moment we have discussion so no it's um it's the first quarter is going to be horrendous for airlines who are going to be struggling for cash um and you know back in the market for more loans um are going to have to scale their networks back um kk you will probably be one of the few people working between christmas and new year doing more network plans i guess i have up to version 25 now <laughs> Right. Um. I mean, uh, John. But I personally think the the markets with huge domestic travel. Um. I mean, in terms of domestic recovery, it could be faster. May not be quarter one, but you know, there's actually. Um. I'm quite. Op I mean, optimistic. It might be between quarter two, quarter three that we already see, you recover to a pre-COVID level. Um, yeah, I, I think. Your point. Sorry, go ahead. Sure. I think we're losing um, <clears throat> losing KK's sound there uh, slightly, but um, I think I think the, the the you know the 2021 challenge essentially is you know yes there's optimism about vaccines as uh, as we've said, but the reality of um, distributing those vaccines globally in the scale that's needed. The, the point that you made, Hannah, about you know countries having different approaches to how they how they choose to vaccinate people. So do you do you protect the the economy by um, you know uh, vaccinating all of the um, the sort of integral workers and frontline workers, or do you do the vulnerable approach? All, all of that complexity <clears throat> is not going to um, uh, be resolved soon. Um, you know, I think the UK vaccinated 5,000 people yesterday, so 60 million people um, over uh, 5,000 a day would take a long time, and that's just the, the, the first, uh, you know, the first cut of a, a two-phase vaccine. I think the challenge then for airports and for airlines, perhaps more pressingly for airlines, is without the return of mass travel, 
um, in 2021, how survivable it is another season. You know, mm. how survivable is the next the next six months in terms of actually getting coming out the other side of this? Um, and I guess then we've already seen airlines restructuring. We've already seen airlines taking a look at how to operate their businesses going forward. These are not short term mm. um, temporary decisions anymore. These are fundamental structural changes to how these businesses will operate, aren't they? They are, but as, as we've noted before, I mean, you know, when this pandemic hit around April of last year, many, many travellers who had holiday plans for summer 2020, you know, for the Caribbean and for the United States, or wherever it happened to be, big, expensive, once in a lifetime holidays, just instructed their agent to roll it over 12 months. So there's many people sitting there who, bizarrely, already have their 2021 holiday booked and probably majority paid for, and the airlines will have those in their systems. So it's getting through the first four months of next year that for some um, is going to be the great challenge. But then ironically, uh, they could be in a situation where suddenly they're quite busy and they've got everyone from last year who's still looking to travel. And that, that will be the same in Japan, where there will be people who bought Olympic packages and, you know, will will still want to try and get to Tokyo for the Olympics. The challenge, though, for airlines is that that's not new revenue, is it? I uh, know, but a lot, at least they can then recognise the revenue rather than having it on their books. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're using yeah. it for cash, but they can mm -hmm. at least recognise the revenue. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's, why, you know, I'm start, that's why I'm starting a travel agent, book early. Because fares are going up soon. <laughs> <laughs> so from from the from the airport point of view, uh, the, our challenge is that uh, even if the demand comes back quicker than expected, uh, it takes more time to for us to prepare well in advance to uh, accept more flights because uh, after the COVID nineteen crisis has happened. Uh, not only our airport, but also any airport in the world experienced some kind of job cut uh, for the ground handlers or ground agencies and airline people and the airport staffs and so on and so forth. It's uh, not the exception for our airport. It means that uh, if we want to uh, handle the 19 and 20, no, sorry, sorry, uh, 2019 levels, we have to uh, hire again certain amount of people uh, in a short time period. It must be a very, very challenging, challenging task for us. Yeah. Well, I, I, you know, I ran a story last week where, uh, and it was uh, from a, a US source, so, um, you yeah, know, but it was basically saying the pilot shortage has, the global pilot shortage has not gone away. In fact, mm. it's, probably got, it's probably got worse in the last nine months because there are many people who were pilots and flight deck and, and cabin staff who have been fortunate and found other employment and have realised that there is life outside of aviation mm -hmm. and it's more social and it's more regular hours and it pays just as well. So, um, you know, just be careful because one day you might end up on an aeroplane and, and Deirdre and I might be flying it and I would I'd get off it very, very <laughs> That that would scare me. Yeah, yeah. India ear, John, you'll be fine. India right, right. <laughs> ears, yeah. a little bit of Christmas magic, and we'd, uh, we'd yeah, flap we'd our way around, around, couldn't we? We'd flap our way around. <laughs> Actually, I saw um, uh, something popped up. I think uh, on LinkedIn this morning that Finnair are doing a virtual um, uh, flight yeah. to Lapland. So I might mm -hmm. uh, might have to hop on that later. Um, yeah. carry on with some yeah. Christmas cheer. Um, okay, so um, I'm conscious that we've got lots of questions to to, to get to. Um, I, I think this slide really sort of summarises lots of the things that we've been talking about um, or, or uh, alluding to in terms of, you know, this this um, uh, challenge that the industry faces in terms of pent up demand, but um, continued restrictions of, about um, you know, some countries uh, restricting travel, Qantas, for example, um, mandating uh, vaccination, and we're going to come on to that really in, in our first kind of question area. Um, and an interesting, um, interesting to see from Eurocontrol, um, just just a nod because I know they're listening in today. Um, that wasn't planned, honestly. 
Um, but, you know, um, we are seeing already predictions about um, what the future might look like in a world where the vaccination, um, uh, you know, the, this pace of vaccination is not what everybody would want it to be, um, or indeed that the vaccination is not, not effective. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that none of us really want to contemplate, I think, but, you know, a, a, a potential reality in, in an untested situation. Um, so let's move on to, um, we tried to group our questions into, into topic areas, and this is roughly what, what, um, what we saw. I think this issue of health passports and vaccinations, and you know, um, I've, I've seen the phrase vaccine nationalism um, being quoted uh, increasingly. Um, you know, so in the same way that we saw countries shut down their borders um, to to restrict the spread of COVID, um, it doesn't seem unrealistic that um, we may have countries uh, preventing travel um, unless you've received a vaccine um, or, you know, unless you can demonstrate you've got the, the health passport. Now, We've talked uh, in the past about, you know, health health certificates are not are not new. The industry, uh, the world has them. Um, anyone who's had a yellow fever vaccination will uh, will know that you have a card. Is is that the answer? Is that something that um, you know? Can we predict what that's what that's going to look like? Is there going to be a common global standard? There should be, but will there be? Thoughts on that for the panel? Well, I mean, I think that's something that IATA and WHO have really got to, you know, get their heads together and, and come out with something. But it's going to be incredibly complicated. You know, what happens if one vaccine is actually more effective than another? Do you will that matter? You know, if you've got the AstraZeneca vaccine versus the Pfizer versus Moderna versus Sinovac? Um, you know, are there going to be preferences as well? Maybe people will think, oh, no, the Russian one, they've, they've lied about the stats. And, I, you know, we're not going to let people in with that. Um, there's this whole added layer of complication, even if you're just thinking about testing, you know, let alone the vaccines. And the testing is how do you then um, get every small clinic who, who are doing these tests to, to, you know, join a system to authenticate it? You know, it's just logistically a real nightmare. but eventually something is going to have to happen maybe it will just have to be as simple as a yellow fever you know certificate to start off is with it, because trying to integrate those systems is going to be so hard is it a multi it's, 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 it's good, isn't, it? isn't it there's there's layers here so you know i can i can see that we are going to need some sort of passport for both vaccinations and and health but you know we will i think inevitably still be expected um, to uh, have a COVID check pre-departure and probably in some cases at airports as well before you get on the aircraft and perhaps even on arrival. So, you know, this complexity that we are seeing is going to be here for a period of time and it, it, it's a completely different scale to 911 when, you know, we were suddenly being told turn up at the airport three hours early because uh, you're going to go through a series of security points rather than just one security check and all of these sort of things. Uh, but I, we are, it's an inevitability of where we are. And in th three, five years time, we may all say, do you, do you remember when we had to do X, Y, and Z? But for the next 18 months, two years, this is going to be part and parcel of traveling. I, I can't see a way of us avoiding all of those requirements. Um, and uh, you know, someone's, uh, Harry's made the point here um, in one of these uh, questions, you know, actually an individual country, even if you've got all the protocols in place, can still, you can take off and the next morning they can say, sorry, we've changed the rules. Yeah. yeah, I, 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 wonder, so, yeah. I, I wonder to what extent, you know, the point you were making, Kentaro-san, about, about um, even for the experienced traveller, it's difficult now to navigate the rules. I wonder to what extent that continuing uncertainty will dampen demand, um, you know, and, mm. and push that, push those travel plans back another year where people say, you know what, it's it's too difficult, it's too expensive. Mm. Um, and, and as much as, you know, we're desperate for some sunshine or somewhere different or, 
something to to not remind us of what we've all been through um actually it, there are too many barriers at the moment to to, to make it really yeah really yeah available. yeah exactly so even before the COVID-19 crisis the air travel especially for the international air travel is not, not the usual thing for, for the Japanese people uh, so it means that uh, someone introduced uh, as a kind of system to uh, prove I'm I'm safe against the, the whales. Uh, it would be the harder barrier to uh, to be to be a traveler. So, uh, in my opinion, if the all nations uh, introduce the same kind of the vaccination system or health uh, system to prove. Uh, it will be okay, but as Hannah and, and John mentioned, uh, probably the each uh, countries introduce completely different kind of system. It would be a messy thing for everyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it goes to um, what KK was saying, though, doesn't it? About you know, domestic markets are going to be where where everyone's going to feel so much more comfortable. If you have a large domestic market. Um, for an airline, at least at least you've got you know a, a reasonable base of demand that you can start tapping back into. Yep, yep. John, I mean, you know, I I'm supportive of vaccine passport only if it's practical. I think mm -hmm. you know, it will probably take a number of years before we have majority of population will be vaccinated and given a passport. Then for us as an airline operator, um, Every route that we operate is basically uh, supported, or I mean, hopefully, ideally supported by passengers from both point of origins, right? So mm -hmm. it's not that easy to actually have, um, I mean, this is again like the negotiation on travel bubbles where it has to be bilateral um, agreement on whether you know you just allow people with vaccine or you insist that only people with vaccine passport can travel or it can be replaced with testing uh, before boarding. Yeah. Well, I wonder what one of the questions we had um, in advance was about the impact of, of this situation on airline yield. And, you know, we've seen already, um, <clears throat> certainly in short haul markets, airlines trying to stimulate demand um, with with um, low fares. You know, to, to what extent will, so it's another layer, isn't it? It's another layer of uncertainty about making the decision to travel becomes harder. So will we see another push at trying to stimulate the market with, with lower fares? Um, or does the messaging have to be much more about you know, what we were talking about earlier in terms of um, will we ever not have um, a, a condition where you can rebook travel um, at three weeks notice or decide not to travel and get a full refund? Or you know, I think, I think the consumer will demand much more of those kinds of things that you ordinarily wouldn't get as a as an economy um class traveler um you know that flexibility in ticketing uh and the ease that you can react to changes in the wider environment um as a passenger will will need to come i think will need to be there it's all of, it's all of those things isn't it it's not just one you know i mean we've seen we've seen in the us um, domestic yields fall by 20% in the last couple of months um, and they didn't during the first spike of COVID because you couldn't stimulate demand for love or money but this time in that sort of gap between spike one and spike two there was you know airlines went out and were reinforcing the message about confidence and cleanliness and all of the protocols and also reducing airfares um, so it, it, it's going to be everything, and that's exactly why, Deirdre, I'm selling tickets. And if anyone needs my email address, I'll we'll let them have it. We can, uh, we can cut the commission. I think, need a, I think you need a share of this, John. There's some sort of commission. We need to do something. But you know, seriously, I, I think there is a there is airlines are going to be desperate for cash in this first quarter of 2021, and they are going to be looking to stimulate the market and get what revenue they can in. And it will be as flexible as they, you know, as we probably need in terms of refunds and vouchers. I mean, KK, how? What's your view on this as an airline? Are you, are you seeing yields beginning to nudge a bit further south? 
Um, John, I think, you know, for, for major part of 2020, we don't even want to talk about you management <laughs> because it's not <laughs> to manage, right? I mean, to start with, the industry is not really a high yielding industry, right? The rust is going down. Uh, yeah. But I think what will happen post pandemic is the cost of travel will go up um, just like today, right? There is, um, there's a cost for testing. There's a cost for vaccination. Um, mm -hmm. At some destinations, there's cost for quarantine as well that you need to pay. So the mm -hmm. total cost will go up, and unfortunately, I think airline would not be the beneficiary of this whole process. Mm -hmm. um, the travel, I mean, the airfare cost, well, airfare may go down, just to facilitate um, the overall travel cost to be to remain um, reasonable. But then I think at some point, um, the industry cannot subsidize travelers as well, right? I mean, we have ancillary income and whatnot, but then at some point, the fare, the airfare has still has to go back to what it should be. Yeah. Yeah. Lots of questions about vaccine distribution, um, be because you know that's that's kind of where we are right now, isn't it? You know, in terms of um, <clears throat> thinking about how we get as much of the world vaccinated as possible. <clears throat> Is this a, in the same way that we saw carriers? Um, benefit in terms of it was at least some revenue from shipping um, PPE around the world um, in the first wave of, of COVID. Is the distribution of vaccine and the sort of associated cargo that that brings? A, a, I want to say a shot in the arm, but that's a really bad pun. Oh. Um, <laughs> but you know, is, is this just another thing that will help a little? those airlines um, get through another few months in terms of a, a fairly large scale, um, whenever that gets off the ground, distribution of vaccines around the world? I don't know, Deirdre, but uh, taking that analogy further, I mean, you know, it could be a pain in the whatever for some, um, because they, they're constantly adjusting from being a passenger to a cargo airline. And we know that passenger airlines generally don't make great cargo airlines. Um, the one, the one, I'm sure that there are airlines out there like Emirates Cargo, for example, and I, I see Delta have now got dispensation to carry more dry ice on board their 767s and, and move more uh, vials of, um, of the vaccines. I, th I think it's inevitable that the cargo market is going to have another sort of strong six months moving these shipments around, absolutely no doubt about it. And this is good cargo. This is not bad cargo in terms of you know, it's not PPE that is light and bulks out very quickly. This looks like this is quite dense cargo that is going to be good yield and you're going to get a lot of it on uh, to an aircraft. So uh, I think for, for the airlines who are placed to carry that, that's really good for the countries that are going to get it. It's really good. Um, but, you know, in time, as with all of these things, we will it will become just a normal part of the whole cargo market and the distribution of of products and, and produce all around the world. Hmm. Mm. Sorry, but John, John, um, I think it's probably easier to carry the PPEs and whatnot because you know we can still convert the cabin um, into cargo loading to carry PPEs. But vaccine, I think the biggest challenge will be the temperature control. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and, and yeah. that's yeah. important. Yeah, uh, if if it's going to be a good EU cargo for the airlines, that means um, the vaccines will be costlier, right? <laughs> it's going to be the base for us as well. Yeah, KK, you're absolutely right. But you know, when PPE was initially being moved, cargo rates increased sixfold, um, just just to move shipments as quickly as possible. Uh, and I, it probably won't go to that uh, multiple. And it will be a more regular process of production, which means you know there's more reliability in the whole distribution chain, which means that the cost can be more effective. But but it will come at a price. It's you know it's that's what happens, I'm afraid. Mm. And I think that's the that that's the the sort of global debate right now, isn't it? You know, in terms of how how the vaccine will be distributed around the world, um, and every you know. To what extent will countries have the ability to source the vaccine that, that, that they need? And then I guess, you know, f for a global industry like ours, 
the knock on effect of that um, is, is again, it's another one of those things we just don't know yet in terms of, you know, if you if you've got um, wealthy nations um, all having got to a certain level of vaccination um, and maybe achieving herd immunity um, amongst the, the population. I'm, I might be mixing my uh, not a scientist, um, but I might be mixing my my my, uh, my my knowledge there. But you know, and then we've got parts of the world um, that that haven't that are on a different um, timeline of that. Then that doesn't it doesn't help the industry, does it? It doesn't unlock the not the so global cool. connections that we need to 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 thrive really. Mm. Uh, uh, just out of interest, I mean, in each of your home markets, will what's the what's the view on vaccine uptake? I mean, would you expect a large proportion of the population to, to take the vaccine, or is it there's some scepticism? Hannah, what's it like in Malaysia? Um, Malaysia, I think people are pretty excited. Um, but I saw a study, and it's a study I think back from 2018 now, that said in countries like the Philippines, um, like Vietnam, like Indonesia, actually there's quite a, a lot of scepticism around vaccines, um, mainly mm. because there was a, deng a dengue vaccine that, that kind of went wrong, I think, and they were in vaccinating children against it, and it, it didn't work, and it was quite risky. So there is perhaps that perception that that may have harmed harmed it but um you know indonesia is looking to start rolling out its vaccines in the next uh, next couple of weeks they've already received shipment from china um i think they're just mm -hmm. waiting for the go ahead so certainly these countries are going to be pushing it as hard as they can just because their their economies rely so much on it and kentaro san in japan yeah yeah uh actually the the news for of the introduce of the vaccine is not so broadcasted yet in japan because the uh, the number of cases in Japan is still relatively low uh, compared to other countries like United States or UK or other European countries. But uh, in order to accept the Olympic Games audience, uh, the vaccination vaccination will be the one of the key issue to go forward because the Japanese people is still aware of the COVID-19 wells that will be uh, brought from other countries by the audiences. In order to uh, give the better confidence to the people living in Japan, uh, the government would need some more uh, way to uh, persuade them. So it's, it's okay because they are already uh, vaccinated before, before their departure. So in terms of that, the vaccination will be uh, the key issue to uh, revive Japan as a destination country at the first stage. But the second stage, I would mention that uh, the Japanese people is not so aware about the vaccine yet, because as I having said that, the, the situation of Japan is not so bad mm -hmm. right now, yeah. And, and, and indeed, I think I've seen um, news in the last week or so, Kentaro, that there is there's a plan to restart business travel between China and Japan um, and some yeah, other markets. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, that that's a very great news. But uh, in reality, I when I have a chance to talk with some companies, which includes the Toyota Motor companies, uh, the car. The current framework is too complicated to <laughs> to use for the uh, for their short-term business travel. So yeah. uh, once the regulation uh, will be eased, the so many people want to use this kind of uh, system. But at this moment, nobody wants to <laughs> uh, use as much as possible yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I think we're we're seeing that, aren't we? I mean, the UK I think announced last week um, plans to um, fast track and to have no mm -hmm. quarantine for um, mm -hmm. very very specific, a very specific set of business business mm -hmm. travel requirements. And it, it's interesting that those sort of feel like pragmatic mm -hmm. solutions or pragmatic um, processes that governments are trying to put in place to recognise that there is some trade that we just we we need to start again and and um, yeah. get back on on track but 
you know, you can see quite quickly, can't you, that, um, you know, the skittishness, Hannah, of the of the Hong Kong uh, travel bubble situation, um, it's only going to take one of those kind of situations um, and we'll, we'll be back, uh, back on the back foot again. Um, KK, did, did you have any thoughts about the uptake of vaccinations in, in the Philippines? Yeah, I'm just going to, to borrow what Hana published. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think the Philippines expected to only have 0.9%. By second quarter 2021, is that correct, Anna? <laughs> I, I picked yeah, it up from that's what I calculated. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They've got yeah. an order of something like they they can cover a one million people, I think, and obviously their population mm -hmm. is a lot bigger than that. So, yeah. mm -hmm. but um, the numbers don't what? quite add up, do they? I I think you know that I am not sure whether people have really started to think hard on uh, how the vaccination program can be rolled out in countries with uh, you know very huge geographical area in the remote areas i mean being temperature sensitive um, chicago it's not going to be easy to to move into the remote areas um, in philippines indonesia or borneo um, i mean in this part of the world um, i think that is going to be a challenge yeah yeah no yeah absolutely i think i think the distribution um it even um it, with the temp you know, certainly for the Pfizer vaccine, with the temperature requirements, even in uh, developed countries, it's, it's challenging um, to, to 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 have a rollout that actually works and and keeps everything at the temperature it needs to be at. So, add into that complexity about um, infrastructure, um, then it's you know it's uh, yeah it all of that. You know, whenever I see an optimistic headline about whatever percentage of a country will be vaccinated by a certain date, it you know, I uh, I feel quite cynical uh, about that, but we'll get there. We'll get it's a bit hollow, isn't it? Just doesn't yeah yeah doesn't ring. So we're 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 out of time, unfortunately. Um, it's been a fascinating discussion. Um, any final pressing things that anyone would like to say, John? Have you got any final? Uh, uh, I think a lot of people asked us about market recovery, and you know, I think I think. To, to try and answer answer it, I mean, all, and it's, you know, saying all doesn't sound right, but all the vaccine has probably done has uh, given us a bit more reassurance of a recovery by 2024, um, rather than actually accelerating it forward significantly because of some of the issues we've discussed today and the yeah. fact that, you know, traveler sentiment needs to be rebuilt, the logistics of getting this vaccine to places, um, the, the amount that some countries can afford to purchase, you know, relative to population size, um, reluctance of people, 10% of people in the United Kingdom apparently are, are afraid of a needle and an injection. So, you know, that, that doesn't help. Um, so in terms of market recovery, I think we'll see a pickup in the second half of 2021. Uh, you know, I desperately hope for everyone that that is the case, but to get back to where we were is still still i think looking at 2024 even with this vaccine being in place which is which is a great shame and shows how how damaging it's been yeah yeah well on that sobering thought uh, i think we will wrap it up there um thank you so much to the panel for coming back um it's been great to hear from you all again and uh, thanks for giving up your time and uh, sharing your your thoughts and insights with us um john's john's parting shot is uh, the, the 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 reindeer um the reindeer I can set, light, I can set a light to him in this candle here if anyone wants to wait <laughs> so listen thanks everybody for joining us um we've tried to bring you a little bit of uh, of, of of levity to what is not a uh, still not a um uh optimistic subject but lots of challenges for the industry ahead um, we will be sending as ever a recording um, of the audio and video um, so we'll be captured uh, forevermore with our festive attire um, and um, we're also going to be sending you a short survey um, in the follow-up email so please take some time to to fill that in if you can be very much appreciated and um, you can al always uh, follow um, OAG's take on uh, COVID-19 and the latest capacity data um, on the website and sign up for the blogs um, and hear more about what's happening. Thanks everybody and we will see you sometime in January. Thank you.
Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.